Welcome to episode 19 of the Various and Sundry podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined actually in studio. In studio. The real physical studio. Yeah. Not virtually. By my good friend, my travel partner around the world, and the man who's recording his final episode as yep. a bachelor. That's right. John Sloat. That's right. Matt, how are we doing today? Doing well. It's great to be back in the studio. Yeah, yeah, even though we have more disturbances in the studio than we did over Zoom, apparently. Yes, we do have the, apparently the lawn mowing is still an essential uh, part of the campus culture here. I'm not even sure we're fully allowed to be doing this in Neither the am I, but I'm, I'm, I'm blown away at how active the office is, to be honest. Well, I, I do know there have been other faculty and staff in the building recently uh, for various and sundry purposes. <laughs> so uh, I'm not I'm not too worried. But um, you can always uh, connect with us through social media. On Twitter, you can follow us at V and S Pod. You can check us out on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, Various and Sundry Podcast. You can check us out there, and we have an email address. So if you'd like to reach out by email, variousandsundrypodcast at gmail.com. And we have been asking, yeah, begging, pleading for reviews and ratings. Requesting. Yeah. Respectfully requesting reviews. Yeah, I think so. And you as the listeners have responded, at least some of you. Quite well. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a another... Uh, review posted, which was very helpful, and one that I'm particularly uh, appreciative of because uh, it was affirming the uh, the fact that they enjoy the Buckeye bias that I provide for this podcast. And you're familiar with that guy, right? You you like know who he is. I know who he is. Yes, and he's in w- w- where is he at? Kansas City. Kansas City. And so we have listeners all the way. Oh my goodness, the mower is like right outside the window. <laughs> all the way in Kansas City. So lovely, lovely. Well, actually, the international scope of the podcast has been slowly and steadily increasing. We have a regular listener, I think, in Ireland. Yes. And one in Slovenia. Yes. Which is, oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> and apparently not one outside yeah. on the mower, but in oh any gosh. case, um, one in Aust- we have a listener in Australia. Yeah. And is- Norway. And Uruguay. Yeah. And I'm, the Philippines. I know the guy in Uruguay. Yeah. So okay. he's, he's, a, he's a friend. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm waiting for the listener in North Korea. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if we ever do get a listener in... North Korea or Iran or some other very closed off country, um, we probably won't acknowledge it publicly just for that person's safety. But But we'll know we've arrived. Yes, indeed. Indeed. So we are back in the studio along with the lawn mowing uh, going on in the background. But um, when it comes to the last dance, yeah, so this were episodes seven, seven and eight this so, past week. So yeah. next week is the last week for it. Yeah. So we'll have nine and ten, and uh, seven and eight were this week, and they, well, it was it was hard to say what these particular episodes were about. It was it was mostly about Michael and how hard he pushed his teammates and how frustrated he made them. Yeah. Uh, they're, there was one about largely about his first retirement and his attempts at baseball. And his there attempts was a, at baseball. A chunk of that. But I appreciated the fact that since there's already been, I think, a 30 for 30 that covers that. Um, they largely glossed they, over it. They, they hit it quickly and then moved on. They didn't, like, really uh, linger on it too much, which I appreciated. But I do think that uh, the biggest takeaway was how hard MJ was on his teammates. Particularly rookies, like trying to toughen them up to make them ready for yes. the playoffs. Um, and and I, I came out of that thinking to myself, because he has strained relationships with a number of people across the league. Yes. Uh, Charles Barkley. Uh, uh, well, obviously Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas, Reggie Miller. Yeah. Um, Ewing. I mean, he he has strained relationships, even with some of his teammates. Yeah. Um, 
And, and I, I just found myself asking the question, and he was like, it was worth it to get to, to win. It was worth it all. And I, I had the question, I just want to ask, was it worth it? <laughs> right. Well, to me, what, what was interesting is that, uh, was it the, um, I can't remember, was it episode seven or eight? Which one ended with them asking MJ, was it worth it? Or what, you know, do you have any regrets? And he like tears up. He, he like tears he up. He gets and emotional and says, we need a break. We need a break, yeah. Now, I was told, I, I haven't read, I didn't see the interview myself, but someone had told me that the director of The Last Dance did an interview and talked about that particular um, exchange with Michael. And ultimately, I guess what, what he said was he came into this series with like 11 pages of detailed notes that he wanted to talk through with Michael about different things. And this this exchange that they just showed was like 40 minutes into the first segment that they were interviewing, like as he was just talking through. Oh, wow. So um, wow, I think that made, from what I understand, that made the director a little nervous. Like, uh uh-oh, I've already made him like tear up and break down. Is he just going to put the kibosh on this and say, we're done, we're not doing this? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I I keep coming back to that book, um, The Cost of These Dreams, where it talks about, yeah, how Michael Jordan is the number two or three bejeweled player in the world, will race anybody in Sudokus that are around him, will, will, I mean, just has to compete at everything and can never rest or yeah. have enjoyment without comparing himself or competing or anything like that. Uh, and I keep coming back to the line of that book, um, the, the Cost of These Dreams, right? Michael Jordan constructed himself to be perfect for the first 40 years of his life, but unable to enjoy the last 40 um, and that's that's what I think I'm seeing uh, in the midst of this yes. podcast. You, you see a man who has a very large gla- glass of scotch that sits next to him for a number of these interviews, <laughs> yes. right? Yes, um, with varying levels of of quantity of liquor yes. in the in the glass. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. more more than a normal pour there. And uh, he he just I, I just see a man. I, I feel sad for him at, at, at some level. I feel bad for him. He just can't seem to enjoy uh, life because of the way he's constructed himself in order to in order to win. Yeah, I think that it was striking to me to hear his teammates talk about about Michael and there's there's clearly a sense of awe of this was the greatest basketball player of all time arguably like it was amazing to play with him. But the fact that it seemed like most of his teammates, really all of them at one level, had had repeated incidents with Michael in practice of him just going after them, and yeah. and in very like I mean next level mean kind of you know, trash talking and and antagonism. Um, I thought the interesting story for me was also the fight he got into with Steve Kerr. Mm-hmm. And you know Steve Kerr is what six, one, yeah, six he, two. He's not the biggest guy. And you Jordan's know? six six, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And Michael was just getting after Steve Kerr, and finally pushed him to the point where the um, it, it just broke him, and he he took a swing at Michael, like punched Michael in the chest. I think is that right? Or yeah, I think like he that? I think he pushed him back and w- was going to hit him more, but was stopped. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Phil Jackson kicked Michael out of practice, and Michael had to apologize privately to to Steve Kerr. But it was interesting to hear them talk about how from that point forward, Michael was like, "We're good. Like you've proven to me that you won't back down in the toughest moments, so I can trust you." Which that's a pretty steep price to pay. Yeah, yeah, the cost of relationship. I mean, I was listening to an interview with Reggie Miller a couple of weeks ago, and Reggie doesn't want to talk to Michael. You know, he's, no. he's like, I'll, I'll punch Michael if I see him, you know. Um, that That's a problem. You know, you might have six championships, but— um, you you don't have good relationships. Probably, I, I believe the players on his own team that he owns are frustrated with him at different times. Um, yeah, I, I think the person that comes out of this looking like the best human and basketball player is actually Kobe Bryant. Uh, the man ha- the man was very similar in his playing method to Michael. Right, mm-hmm. um, has a number of champion championships, not as many as Michael. Right, but was beloved by his family, 
was um, a, won an Oscar uh, for one of his for one of his movies and and was well liked by a number of people uh, in in L.A. Uh, yeah, my my only pushback is: Do we know what he was like in practice? Like, if, if we did the deep dive on Kobe, would there be similar? Maybe not to the same extent, sure, but similar stories of Kobe absolutely tearing down a teammate and getting after them to prepare them for like i don't know the answer to that question so yeah that's my only pushback of we you right. did we, the deep dive on kobe and his practice habits and that sort of thing and how he interacted with his teammates behind closed doors would we have similar stories sure and and maybe and i don't think that footage exists i don't know that they follow around the lakers <laughs> with him and Shaq in their last season and yeah not uh, that i'm aware of yeah, which if if it's out there, I'm excited, right? Because yeah. uh, that's what I remember more than the Bulls. I remember the Lakers with Shaq and Kobe being being right. quite good, right? Well, we're looking forward to the final two episodes coming up this uh, this Sunday. Yeah. It'll be interesting on, to on see. On a how side they... note, I didn't know Michael's dad was murdered. You know, and yeah. I had no clue. Um, so that was that was fascinating, and it was it seemed to be part of the reason. And I love the conspiracy theories as well. Like that, Lots that of was conspiracy theories connected with that. That was that was very interesting. I had not heard the um, the conspiracy theory that David Stern secretly suspended Michael for eighteen months, and they were and they just sort of framed it as he's retiring, but that actually David Stern had suspended him for his gambling activities. I, and I saw a fo- I saw this on Twitter, but I saw a conspiracy theory photo of like everybody at the presser where Michael was leaving, and David Stern has a big smile on his face, and everybody else is sullen. Yeah. <laughs> what a world we live in. Anyway, one other side note on on sports before we move on to our oh, main yes. topic today is the NFL schedule was released. Which do you pay attention to that? Um, like no. when it's released, I mean. Once released, I'll look at the Jets schedule, okay. and, I'll, and I'll usually see who has the, the hardest schedule, who has the easiest schedule, those sorts of things. But no, not regularly. Yeah. I, I don't pay attention to it at all because I don't have a an NFL team that I am invested in. We would love to have you on the Jets bandwagon. <laughs> it would be great to have you That's going to be a hard sell. I think I have a better chance of converting you to an Ohio State fan than you do of hmm. converting me to a Jets fan. That's probably true. <laughs> in any case, I think that— uh, I don't pay attention, but I did see, I don't remember where I saw it, somewhere on Twitter perhaps, that there's a weird fluke in the NFL schedule this year. I don't know if you saw this before I put this on the show yeah. notes, but um, the Jets are going to play the Dolphins in back-to-back games mm-hmm. with a bye week sandwiched in between. And I believe do they? I believe they each have that same bye week, right? And then they'll, right. they'll play on... Yeah, that's apparently never happened before, and uh, and uh, we'll walk through it, I suppose. So back to back doses of Tua for yeah, your of Jets. Tua, if Tua is if Tua is healthy and playing, we'll we'll see. Yeah, that's true. More that's more true. likely, I think Ryan Fitzpatrick. Ah, the Fitz magic. Fitz magic with that beard, the Harvard <laughs> education. <laughs> He's an interesting dude. He is. He's fascinating. Yeah, but. For our main topic today, as we move on here, one of the things that uh, we both love and haven't talked about really on the podcast yet— No, we haven't. —is the whole aspect of travel, that you and I both love to travel. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to say that a significant contributor to our good friendship has been traveling together. Yeah, yeah. And— it's actually a year ago today. We were on a trip uh, with a bunch of students. Uh, yes. we were in uh, we were in Iceland, Reykjavik. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, and that was a that was a wonderful trip. So shout out to that team. We were, we yes. were excited to see Facebook posts go up about a year ago today. Mm-hmm. We were we were overseas. Absolutely. So why don't we just start with this? Why do you think travel is so valuable and important? Obviously, we live in a current period of time where travel is heavily restricted. It's not like it would be easy or even necessarily advisable to get on a plane today and head to Europe or Africa or Asia or wherever you want to go. So why do you think travel is so valuable and important? Yeah, uh, I I think it helps us put together that the world is bigger than our backyard. Mm -hmm. Um, It helps us see that... uh, 
you know, that, that there are other ways of living uh, than the way that we live and, yeah. and that those ways are valuable and good, even though they are different. Um, and, uh, and I help, I, I think it helps us to have a, have a humble understanding of, you know, just how, you know, uh, things, the way we do them are not the, always the best way or yeah. the only way. Um, yes. And so that, that's one of the reasons I love taking students overseas is they see a, a vastly different culture that does things inc- incredibly differently. Yeah. How about yourself? Yeah, I, I agree with those things. And I think very much on a spiritual level, too, I, I always am blown away by meeting fellow believers mm-hmm. in different cultures and experiencing the commonality we have in Christ, even though on many other levels, we're very different, whether it's interests, whether it's hobbies, whether it's even political views, whether it's uh, cultural experiences. All those things are are important and have a value at some level, but at the end of the day, it's remarkable to meet fellow believers in different contexts and realize we are brothers and sisters, and we are part of the same spiritual family. And even though our experience of living out Christianity might look different because of our cultural context, we are still part of the same spiritual family. So those are some of the things that I would add to uh, why I enjoy uh, travel in addition to what you said. Do you have a, uh, do you have a count of how many countries you've been to? Yeah, I was thinking about this on the drive over. Um, I think I'm up to, no, no, I don't. I don't. (laughs) I was, I was, uh, we're probably around 10 or 12, I think. Okay. I think. Yeah. I don't know. I don't want to sit here and begin to list them all. Nah, I don't want that, that to that's be That's not a, good radio. Yeah. But, I don't want to be a, I don't want to flex. How about yourself? I think I'm around 20. Hmm. Somewhere around 20. And let's just be clear. I, I think we both agree that simply flying through an airport doesn't count. Nah. Right? No. As we start to count those, like I've flown through the Madrid airport, but I don't count myself as having been to Spain. Yeah. That that just doesn't fit. You have to leave the airport, I feel like, in order for that to really count. Yeah. Um, do we want to talk a little bit about the trip that we led a year ago? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, why don't you explain what a mystery trip is? Because that's what um, that's what we were on a year ago. And that, that, uh, that term— that idea might not be familiar to some of our listeners, yeah. many of our listeners, I would think. So uh, so at Grace, maybe this is the best place to start. At yeah. Grace, we have a, a requirement placed on every student that they have to have some sort of cross-cultural experience before they graduate. So every year we have trips that run all over the world, um, from going on a civil rights trip through the South, Philadelphia, all the way to, um, I do a spring break trip every year to Taiwan, yeah. um, where I have some friends. Uh, and then we also have trips like the one that you and I led last year called the mystery trip. Yeah. And so the mystery trip, what uh, we do is uh, this was formed, oh, goodness, probably five years ago now. Um, and it, it started because me and, a, and another coworker uh, wanted to lead a trip and we wanted it to be uh, city based and we wanted it to be progressive. And so the, the, mm-hmm. the, the first thought we had was like, let's go D.C., New York, Boston and We'll just sort of work our way up I-95 and uh, stop along the way, be involved in different ministries in those cities. We thought we could yeah. connect easily. And we went and pitched it to the global guy, Carlos, in Atlanta. And uh, and he goes, that's a great idea, but why not make it international and don't tell them where you're going? And nice. we went, we love that idea. <laughs> and and that's, yes. that, that's really where it started. And so the mystery trip, as it stands today, is a progressive trip. That usually hits three to four world cities in about 14 days. And we don't tell students where we're going until we get to the airport and we're getting ready to go. And then we don't reveal the second city until we're leaving the first city. Yes. Um, and so you and I led this last year. Um, and w- do you want to do you want to say where, where we went? Yeah. In fact, this was the second one we led. This is the second year. one we so led. Yeah. Last year, this trip, we, uh, we went to... Reykjavik, Iceland. A great experience. Yeah, absolutely. Iceland's beautiful. And then we went from there to Helsinki, Finland. 
Yeah, one of my favorites. <laughs> yes. You regularly bring that up yeah. in conversation. Oh, yeah. it was a land of coffee and pastries yeah. uh, for, for, for forever. And it was, it was fantastic. And the people were very, very friendly. Yep. Beautiful old European city feel. Without, um, without the effects of war, you know, uh, later in that trip we hit London, yep. and there were there were effects of war everywhere, right? Reykjavik was was, or excuse me, uh, Helsinki. Helsinki was preserved in that sense, yeah, uh, where it had not felt uh, the damages of war. Yeah, the uh, so those three cities were our um, were our destinations. Now the last city was a late audible. Oh gosh, yeah. Where were we? Do we, do you want to talk through this this saga? Um, I don't know. If we want to go through the saga. Maybe a short, very shortened version. Okay. So basically, what happened is you and I had made plans from Helsinki, Finland, to take a train to Saint Petersburg, Russia, oh. and then continue on that train after a few days in Saint Petersburg onto Moscow. I'm getting sad just thinking about it again. And so. Uh, you and I, probably three months before we started going, began in looking into, I maybe mean, three or four months, began to look into um, what it would be like to get visas. Uh, and we realized it was going to cost us an, an arm and a leg uh, to get into Russia. Yeah. Um, as well as uh, sending everybody's passports off to the Russian consulate in order to be approved. Which feels a little risky. It does. <laughs> however, however, we did it. I know. <laughs> I know. We collected everybody's passport, which is one of the reasons we did not, uh, we didn't get to go was we, we couldn't get them in time and yeah. we, had to, we had to send them off. And by the time we sent them off, they said two months. And we're like, well, we, we can't do that. And I will just say, I don't want to go deep dive on this, but it, it took some ingenuity for us to get the students to come in bring their passports, and to get them to sign paperwork. Sign the paperwork. That was the hard part. revealing where yeah. they were going. A lot of man hours went into that. Yeah. 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 And, and we ended up saying, ah, eh, forget it. We'll go yeah. to— we just went to London. We just went to London. So, anyway. Which, oddly enough, was the cheapest of those three cities to visit. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But uh, so in, in terms of— and then the previous mystery trip, why don't you walk through briefly in, in, in 2000, that would have been 17, where the mystery trip was. In yeah, so 2017, uh, we went to uh, Sydney, Australia, Christchurch, New Zealand, um, and then uh, Tokyo, Japan. Yeah. Uh, which it was fun because we had two or three students on that trip who had never been on an airplane before. <laughs> yes. And we drove right to the airport and we handed them the thing and we handed them the piece of paper that told them where they were going. And it was like, okay, we're getting on a plane, and we're going to Sydney through Tokyo. So 14 hours to Tokyo, yeah. nine hours to Sydney. <laughs> yeah, welcome to international travel. <laughs> oh, my goodness, 23 <laughs> hours on a plane. Yeah, yes, but that was a great trip as well. Um, that was a lot of fun. Biking through Sydney was, was – was, Yeah, that was a really fun day. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, that harbor area is really nice and beautiful, and, and they have bike lanes set up da- in, the, in the streets downtown. Oh, yeah. And so it's nice and – reasonably safe though we did have a student that we thought was going to die like yeah. on that yep yep <laughs> almost named uh, an event that he did but we we won't do that no nope. no nope. um any favorite travel memories any anything that uh, that sticks out to you from either our trips or from from other trips yeah i think most of those uh, most of those trips i have like one moment that i kind of go back to uh so for example the uh, the first mystery trip in 2017, lots of fun memories with that. But I think for me, the time in Christchurch, New Zealand, and in particular, there was a day where we took a train from basically the, the southern portion of the South Island of New Zealand across to the northern edge of the island through the mountains. And this was one— you know, you find these rankings all over the place, but it's often listed as one of the top 10 train rides in the world because you go through these unbelievably beautiful yeah. mountain views and that kind of thing. Snow-capped hills. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Though we almost didn't make that trip. We almost didn't make it to the train station. You remember this. Yeah, well, Christchurch, <laughs> we were relying on the bus schedule, yeah. which was pretty consistent except that morning. 
And then uh, you and I were getting ready to call in taxis, and I was I was losing control. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So I think that's probably my favorite memory from that trip. That that combination of oh no, we're not going to make this, and us scrambling. Largely, you. I was more trying to keep the the crowd calm. You were scrambling to try to call taxi companies to try to get enough taxis there to get us to the train station, but we did make it. We did, we did make it, yes. and and it was it was worth it. It, it was very worth it. Yeah, to, to do that. I also think about being in Christchurch. Uh, we went to a church, a campus church service that met in a pub, um, yeah. right there on on the college campus we were uh, working with crew at, and the the I believe the pastor or one of the one of the elders invited us over to their house for. Yes. Uh, a potluck dinner. They said, "Yeah, go pick up some fish and chips and just bring it." And oh, fish and chips! Oh gosh, yeah, and, so good. And we just—that's been a pretty consistent part of our travel. Has been fish and <laughs> chips. <laughs> that's true. Um, we had them in the UK, uh, Australia, uh, Christchurch. Um, yeah, all delightful, sorts of stuff. delightful. Um, but we got to hang out with with believers mm-hmm. in uh, Christchurch yeah. at that at that house. And that was it was fun. it was great. Absolutely. And then, um, what about you? I, I shared a memory from that one. Do you have a different? What about a memory from the the uh, the most recent? So I'll, I'll share two. One okay. from the most recent. Um, we hiked up a mountain in Iceland yeah. uh, that we bust out to. Um, yeah, it was probably what were we, forty-five minutes to an hour on a bus to get out to this place. And that then sounds right. We thought it would be a moderate hike, but it was way more than we anticipated. Yeah. In fairness, I think on the website describing the hike, it was described as. Um, sort of easy to moderate, and I would put it more at the moderate to challenging range. Yeah, and it was just, and we had a beautiful day. It was super windy, uh, but the sun was out, which is rare in Iceland, and we were able to look (laughs) over the bay, look over the city, um, and stand on top of this mountain. It was was pretty cool. Um, And uh, and then from my first mystery trip that I led without you, um, we, uh, we ended up in Dubai, yeah, and one of the things we did in Dubai uh, was we went on a desert safari, is what they called it, I believe. Um, and they 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 picked us up at our Airbnb and played loud Arab club music on the drive, <laughs> and we just kind of drove out in the desert, and yeah. we all kind of had the thought like, "This is it." <laughs> You know, we've we've paid these people to kill us, basically, and uh, we pulled off to the side, and they said, "Hey, yeah, we need to we need to let the air out of the tires. Why don't you go over there?" And we were able to rent four wheelers and ride them across the desert, across sand dunes. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and that was a lot of fun. And then we came back, and they did basically the same thing in cars. We were driving across the sand dunes, and it was just beautiful, beautiful desert. We eventually pulled into. Uh, this place where they were serving dinner, they had a show, they had fire dancers, all sorts of things. It <laughs> wow. was very, very cool. Yeah, that is cool. Um, I wanted to share one other story from the first mystery trip. Okay. Tokyo. I think this is on the list of our greatest travel accomplishments <laughs> when it comes to uh, what we managed to do. So when we transitioned from... Um, Christchurch to Tokyo. We got into Tokyo at like 5 a.m. probably. Yeah, somewhere between around. 5 and 6 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. It and, was way too early. And it's always a, so it's an overnight flight, always a very. With in- John McCain. Yeah. <laughs> yes. John McCain was <laughs> on the flight with us, sitting in first class. We were not. Yeah. But the striking thing is that, um, so we get in at 5 a.m. And, you know, it always takes, it's a process to get off of an international flight. You know, you go through the customs, then you exchange the money, and you're trying to figure out how to, you know, navigate that. You're exchanging currency, you're switching out SIM cards, all that kind of stuff. But our flight got in a little early. And and so we went through that whole process. And then we had to get on the Tokyo subway system Mm -hmm. to get largely across across the city or a, a good chunk away yeah across the city may not all the way across the city but it's at by the time we get onto the the subway system it's like six in the morning six six thirty in the morning so we are hitting morning rush in tokyo and 
if you've never seen any of the YouTube videos where from the Tokyo subway system, the, this is before COVID-19, obviously, but the concept of social distancing was not in existence. No, it was not possible. They have people who literally shove people into these trains and pack them tight, super, super tight. So we and 13 students, so 15 of us total, are getting across, trying to get across through the Tokyo subway system to our Airbnb place. With our luggage. With our luggage. And I believe two changes in there as well. At least. Yeah, I think it was two. That probably sounds right. And so the airport is at the end of one line. So getting on, like, oh, this is great. No big deal. But then every stop we're hitting, massive numbers of people are coming oh, in. Yeah. And I was, we were both terrified. We're going to lose somebody. We're going to lose a student because they're going to miss a change. They're going to miss a, nope, this is the stop we get out, and uh, and we leave them on a train, and we weren't sure how we'd find them again. <laughs> yeah, and we were doing everything off Google Maps on yeah. our phones, and that was, that was really helpful. But um, we can generally, when we were in... Uh, in any country, we can generally pronounce the stops like, oh, it, it's the word that sort of looks like this. Yeah. But with, and, and the the Japanese has the English letters right there, which is very, very helpful. Yes. However, I cannot pronounce a word with that many X's, <laughs> you know? And so um, it was it was challenging to even yeah. communicate what spot we get off of. Yeah. Absolutely, and th- and then <laughs> and then once we got there, we got there. We said, okay, we can't get into our Airbnb until two o'clock. So take your luggage, spread out, go find something. And you and I found a little coffee shop. Do you yes. remember this? Yes, absolutely. And we had been on an overnight flight, and they had an upstairs. We got a cup of coffee or two. Yep. We went and sat upstairs, and you and I took separate turns going into the bathroom just to like use the water in the <laughs> sink to like wash <laughs> off just a yeah. little bit. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Well, one other kind of trip I wanted to mention before we uh, move on here is the um, our trips to biblical lands, mm. right? So that's actually the first trip you and I took together was to Israel. That's right. In 2011. You were 2011. a seminary student at that point. Yeah, yeah. And so um, what are some of the things, what were some of your takeaways from doing that kind of trip? That's different, obviously, than a than the kind of mystery trip we just described. What were some of your takeaways from going to the land of Israel? Yeah, um, going to going to Israel was different uh, in that in, in most of these places you go to, I want to I want to get out of the tourist traps. I want to I want to yeah. get to a small cafe. I want to talk to a local. I want to do those sorts of things. When you're in Israel, you're basically on a bus going from site to site to site to site. Yep. Um, and so I think one of the things that struck me, uh, and I think it helped, it certainly helped me put together the geography yep. of scripture. But uh, it also helped me understand that how small of a piece of land Israel is. Yes, very much so. Um, and uh, and when it when it described in scripture when it described the wilderness that David was in, yeah, I always kind of assumed that this was a thick forest, you know, kind, kind of like I would um, sort of a, sort of an American forest. Or, yeah, it's just pretty much desert. Yes. Um, now they're they're in Gadi and Gadi, excuse me, and some yeah. other places were a little bit different, but. Um, yeah, it was it was it was pretty rock and sand, rock and sand, and yeah. it was beautiful. It was yeah. it was stunning in its own right. Yeah, uh, but uh, but yeah, those those are some things that stick out to me. And then um, just to see uh, uh, Jerusalem and see the city and how mm-hmm. how you go up to Jerusalem was yep. was great. And then also seeing how tenuous things are over there was was fascinating and a little eye opening to me as well. Yeah, yeah. How about yourself? You've well, led a few more I, of those, I've, right? I've been to Israel three times. Okay. And so um, one of the things I always look forward to is uh, going through Hezekiah's tunnel. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. Uh, King Hezekiah in the 7th century BC, uh, his engineers built a basically a tunnel, I suppose you could call it that, but it's a channel to, to, to funnel an underground stream for, uh, for water purposes in the city. And so you can walk through it today. And if you're claustrophobic, this is not for you because it's underground. And um, most of the way I could stand up straight, I'm 6'2". So, you know, most of the way I could stand up straight. But there are stretches where you had to bend down a little bit. And it's so narrow that it's single file and it's pitch black. So you take flashlights in. Flashlights. They give you a little flashlight. It's a keychain flashlight. 
I brought my own. Okay, okay. <laughs> I've, I've learned the lesson. And so uh, just fat. And by the way, you're walking in, uh, in this tunnel you're walking in, there's water up to your, depending on the time of year and how wet it's been, up to your, you know, between your ankles and your calves. And at some points, like even as high as maybe your waist when you enter the, the tunnel. Which can be so. horrifying for a claustrophobic person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So in any case... So what are some takeaways here? Travel tips, suggestions. I mean, I think we've sort of painted the picture of some of the value of traveling. But as you think about if you're even if you're talking to students or even just people listening who are thinking, okay, what are some things I could glean from John Sloat in terms of best mm. practices for travel? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think you've already hit on one in terms of trying to get out, meet locals, have conversations, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of it. And then asking for recommendations like, hey, what's, you know, we know the tourist sites, right? Yeah. Where, where do we need to go? Mm-hmm. Um, I'll never forget having uh, a conversation in England on a train platform with two gentlemen, and they recommended you and I go to, to, a, uh, to a food mart. Mm-hmm. That was in uh, r- right near some of the tourist sites in London, and we did it. We took all our students there, and it was great food, oh, amazing, food. and um, it was mostly non-tourists that were there. Yeah, uh, and that was that was very welcome. Um, so that's that's one uh, one thing I would mention. Uh, I'll never forget uh, when when we were in Israel, I was taking pictures of everything, mm-hmm. um, and I remember uh, Zach in Ohio. Saying to me, I just don't want to view this through a lens. And so I've kind of taken that approach anytime I travel now, is, yeah. I, is I try not to live through a lens. Um, I try to see it with my eye, I try to remember it. I assume other people are taking pictures and I can access those in the future. But uh, but yeah, I try not to live through a lens. I think you take the fewest pictures of anybody I know <laughs> when we travel. Like, I, I, I think I, I've been struck by that. Um, I, I tend to take a lot more pictures than you, though I do try to, to keep in mind that experience. And I have enjoyed one advantage of going back to Israel multiple times is after you've gone the first time. You've taken all the pictures. You've taken you all the to. pictures basically you want. And so you, you end up taking a few more pictures with people yeah. you know, that are you know, that you're on the trip with. But in terms of enjoying the actual experience, I, I have appreciated that more of being able to not feeling that pressure of having to get all the pictures, but just to sort of sit, pause, reflect, soak in what I'm experiencing. Yeah. Any any tips from uh, from you? Well, I like to keep a journal when I mm-hmm. travel. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. It's just I, I, I make note of where we've been, what we did. Um, if there's any sort of funny or you know significant experience, I like to write that down because it's amazing how quickly you end up forgetting yeah. things that happened. Or even just experiences, and even just trying to capture, um, not just sort of a we went here, then we went here, but but oftentimes, you know, anything that if the Lord sort of you know brings to mind, or it's like wow, I'm really struck by this, to try to capture that as well. So um, I've got journals of of most of my, tra- I think all of my travels since I've been, um, I think every overseas trip I've taken, I've got journals from from those experiences. And those are fun to go back and look. And they also help when people might ask me, hey, you went to London. What was really good? And just that question off the top of my head, I might forget like, oh, there was this great coffee shop here or that Mm. food market you were talking about. So I can go back and look through and go, oh yeah, you want to go here. You know, we went there. That wasn't that exciting. You can skip that as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So it helps me remember and helps me give good uh, suggestions for people. Um, and then I would always, I, I generally, when I travel overseas, cell phones don't work quite as well. You could get Verizon will give you a ten dollar day pass, but that gets expensive pretty quickly if you're there for a week or more. Yep. Um, I would I would recommend getting a SIM card for your phone. Yeah. And just popping it in, and keeping your old SIM card, right? But but popping a SIM card in your phone. Yep. And and spending the thirty forty dollars, it's it's totally totally worth it absolutely absolutely though we did have a bad experience with the ones in tokyo coming back because they had to do something to our phones you remember this they had to change settings to our phones and that jacked it up that was a mess but in any case the other thing that i'll add before we kind of wrap up on this um is exchanging money here's here's a uh here's a pro tip if you can avoid it it's good to avoid exchanging money at the airport because the rates you get there tend to be poor. 
Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes you can't avoid it, but um, sometimes exchanging money on the front end, bef- like here in the States, going to a bank and saying, hey, we're going to this country. Can you exchange this amount? Can get you a little bit better rate. And um, it seems like a lot of places we've been are much more uh, advanced in terms of taking credit cards and debit cards and being less cash-based than the United States is. Not that – and there's a ton of places you can't use debit cards and credit cards, but oftentimes you can use credit cards uh, or debit cards. Yeah, particularly through Europe um, has, yeah. has done really well. Asia a little less so. Yeah. Um, but even in Asia, it's starting to become become more and more yeah. uh, accepted that you can get – uh, to, you can use a credit card there. Not Discover, but you can use your Visa, generally yep. your MasterCard, those sorts of things. Yeah. And just a just a, a side note, if you are in the UK, make sure you exchange any coins before oh, coming gosh. back to the United States because we if got you, stuck if, with— If you can. <laughs> we yeah. got stuck with—, with with British pounds, spend your pounds, yeah, because no, yeah. no, they'll exchange paper, but not coin. Not coinage in any case. Any future trips, like or places you'd want to go, like um, any sort of like bucket list that you haven't been yet. You're like, oh man, I want to get there. Yeah, yeah, I I would love to get to Istanbul uh, someday yeah. and see the 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 uh, Hagia Sophia and um, let's see what else. Um, I I would love to get back to Northern Italy. Um, the food was just, oh my goodness. It was like every meal was like, oh my gosh, that's <laughs> the best thing I've ever had. You know? Yeah. Um, the food was fantastic in Italy. Um, I think I think Switzerland is really interesting. I've never mm-hmm. been to Switzerland. Yep. Uh, Singapore as well, I really want to get to. Um, but yeah, th- those, those are ones that come to mind. How about yourself? Russia. Russia? It's my white whale. <laughs> <laughs> I was disappointed we couldn't get there, but I, I would like to go to St. Petersburg and Moscow. Um, those are a couple of places that I've not been that I'd like to. Um, I'd like to get up into Scotland oh, yeah. and, uh, and Ireland as well. We were in uh, London area, but didn't get a chance to get out into there. Switzerland's on the list as well for me. And I've not been to Italy, so um, I'd like to get to Rome. And also, I wouldn't mind going to Pompeii. Mm. As well as uh, you know Milan and some of the other places. So yeah, I've done Milan before. Milan's excellent, and it's yeah. it's a little it's not touristy as much. Like certainly the main the main Gothic yeah. church there is pretty touristy, but you get a, you get a few blocks from there, you're fine. It's it's not very touristy at all. Yeah. All right, we got to get to our athlete here. We're I know we can talk travel. All we day. we easily could. So athlete, who we got? Okay, so on our list for number 19, uh, Johnny Unitas. Uh, yes. Colts yeah. quarterback. Uh, Willis Reed, uh, New York <laughs> Nick. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, came in and hit two threes to start the— uh, the, Is it the 73 NBA Finals or something like that? Yeah, it was early say, 70s. Early it? 70s, yeah. yeah. Um, when the Garden was eaten, I'd recommend that, uh, <laughs> that uh, 30 for 30. Yeah. Uh, Tony Gwynn, uh, possibly the greatest hitter that ever lived. Uh, Tony, Tony, or at Glenn. least at least of recent generation. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, and then, do you want to walk us to the Ohio State Buckeyes? Yeah. So it's not like the number nineteen has been exactly um, a, a high a high volume number in terms of you know famous players, but two stand out. I'm going to go with first uh, Ahmed Plummer, a cornerback in the late '90s, but most noteworthy, Tom Tupa, who played quarterback and punter. For the Buckeyes I like in, Tom. in the mid '80s, and ended up on your beloved New York, New York Jets. Jets. Yeah. Now he didn't play much quarterback in the NFL. Well, he was, he was always very. They were always worried about him faking a yeah. punt. They were always everybody was very concerned with it. Yeah. So just a, a fascinating combination of positions that just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. So who do you like? I don't know. I, I don't know. Do you have any that you're ready to eliminate? No. I, um, <laughs> uh, well, if I take all five, a mod plumber, I'm willing to eliminate. Yeah, we can get rid of a mod plumber. But yeah. I'm willing to consider uh, uh, Tom Tupa. Yeah. I, I. Again, please, listeners, keep in mind, we are not claiming that whoever we choose is the greatest individual to wear that number. We're just saying 
we really like this guy or this guy interests us. And he he represents both Ohio State and the Jets. That's Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. You yeah, good? I'm good with Tom okay. Tupa. Okay, Tom Tupa. Talk about thinking outside the box here. All yeah. right. One thing we liked this week. So, John, what do you got for us? Well, uh, to kind of go along with our travel, um, there's a travel podcast I listen to that you can go back and listen to. They have great hacks. They do interviews with people that um, travel professionally all the time. Uh, So they talk about airplanes a lot, all those things. If you're traveling at all, it's a great podcast to listen to. It's called Travel Genius. Hmm. Um, And it's it's an excellent, excellent podcast. They recommend apps all sorts of things, travel clothes even, how to travel with children, all, all those sorts of things. Nice. Very, very nice. How about yourself? Yeah. So mine has been um, – so I'll try to keep this brief. i got to give a, enough explanation to make uh, make people understand what I'm talking about here. But So my grandfather passed away in, uh, in January. Hmm. He was 94 years old, moved buildings – as a job for his entire life and took over that building moving business from his father, Oscar. Um, So this goes back generations Mm. in, in the Harmon family. And so uh, going through some of his stuff, we discovered that my grand grandfather, whose actual name was junior, that wasn't a nickname. (laughs) He was the youngest of, was it 11 or 12 kids? So huge family. Yeah. Yeah. And um, by the way, I discovered my my great grandfather Oscar lost his left hand in a farming accident, so had a hook for a left hand really? for most of his life. Hook Harmon. Yeah, <laughs> this is fascinating to me. <laughs> Found pictures of it. It's amazing. In any case, so my grandfather, starting in 1949, kept a log of what they did at work every day. Hmm. And so a lot of it is just, you know, went to look at this job, raised this house up, this piece of equipment broke, that kind of stuff. But sprinkled in are these personal, like, events that happened, like this person died or this Hmm. person uh, was born. So it's been fascinating to go through those. And we we picked some specific dates to look through and, you know, found that when they went to Kate and I's wedding— you know, went to Athens, stayed here, Matt and Kate's wedding the next day, the day after, had brunch with um, the Hudson's, hmm. stopped at Rocky Mount, uh, Rocky Boot Company on the way back to buy boots. You know, just fascinating little things. Huh. But um, this was the, 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 the cool moment. So last, this is actually last night. I'm looking through these. I'm just working year by year. And I got to 1958. Mm -hmm. So I'm like nine years in, right? And I discover that my grandfather, so my dad's dad, who's keeping these logs, moved a building for my mom's dad in 1958. So my parents hadn't met yet. They were like seven or eight. So my grandpa moved a building for my other grandpa before my parents even knew each other. So coming across in these logs and discovering... Norman Fitzenreiter, oh my gosh, that's my mom's dad, moved a chicken coop, cost him $500 back in the day, hmm. which is the equivalent of like $4,500 today. So yeah. just fascinating family history that I've been working through and, and enjoying. So that's, oh, that's my great. one thing I like this week. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, a little different. That's cool. A little different. So are we ready to say mission accomplished here? I, I think here? so. I think so. So last dance, travel, Tom Tupa. Tom Tupa. Who could have predicted that? And and uh, and family journals and uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I just blanked on your one thing you liked this week. Oh, oh, the travel podcast. Travel there you podcast. Go. There yep. you go. That, by definition, I think We've done is it. our various and sundry topics. And so, until next time, the Lord bless y'all real good. Later.